All right, well, it is 531. So I'm just gonna start by saying hello, everybody. I'm Heather from Kenmore Camera. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanna thank Sony uh, for partner partnering with us on this class, Tips and Tricks. And as always, I wanna thank everyone here for supporting us and other small businesses alike. Um, if you can open your Q&A window that you can find at the bottom here and put your questions in there. We have Sarah in the background from Sony that's going to be helping out with answering your questions. And if you want to go in your chat window and do the drop down menu at the bottom and set it to everyone, that way everyone can see um, your chats and we have any information that we can share with each other, then everyone can see it. And we have Hector here from Sony. He is teaching our class today. I'm sure you're all familiar with Sony or with Hector if you've taken any other Sony classes. And um, I'm just gonna go ahead and hand it over to you, Hector. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And thanks to everyone for showing up today. We've got uh, Sony Alpha tips and tricks. So we're gonna be covering some tips and tricks that are gonna make your Sony Alpha life better. So we're gonna start by sharing my screen over here. And we switch to that. Bear with me one moment. All right, so again, good evening, everyone. My name's Hector. Uh, questions are highly encouraged. Uh, as Heather just mentioned, if you've got a question, you can click on the Q&A icon that should be next to chat. That's where you're going to put any and all questions. If you drop in a question in the chat, we're not really going to be able to attend to that. So anything that comes up, please put it into the Q&A section. Uh, as a good tip, don't wait till the end of the class, even though we're going to have some time for question and answer at the end. As soon as you think of something, particularly if it's related to what we're talking about at the time, drop that in the Q&A. That way we can get it uh, attended to. Got Sarah from Sony here helping out in the background. She's going to answer some questions while I teach, and then we'll have some time at the end uh, for just question and answers that we didn't get to. All right, so before we get started, I wanted to mention that uh, we did manage to secure a special Sony discount for all registered attendees of today's class. Uh, you'll be receiving an email with more information on this later, but basically we're going to be doing up to 10% off on select camera bodies and 15% off on select lenses, memory cards, accessories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just a couple of notes. This is good for a week. So from today until the 27th, you have to be a registered attendee of this class. So don't uh, mention this to anyone else. They won't be able to get this. Uh, Kenmore will be doing nationwide shipping, no international, and it's limited to in-stock items, so no special orders or rain checks. I will bring this up again towards the end. If anyone has any questions, you will be getting all of those details in an email after this class. <clears throat> so first up, I'd just like to start by sharing some resources that are gonna make your Sony Alpha life more productive. First up is gonna be alphauniverse.com. Alpha Universe is going to be your source for all things Sony Alpha, from inspiration to education and the latest on imaging from Sony. Unlike most brand websites, this isn't just a bunch of product pages with spec sheets. There's actually a lot of great useful information in Alpha Universe, from ways to better your photography, to seeing the kits of different photographers, to seeing what Sony events are coming up. One of my favorite features on Alpha Universe, it's the What's in My Bag series. You can see an example of this at the top left there. And it's a quick snapshot of a photographer's kit. It could be a landscape photographer, street photographer, or someone that shoots portraits. You get to see what Sony cameras and lenses they're using for their work. And the cool thing is that it's not just Sony gear. You can also see all of the other gear that they bring with them down to tripods, bags, filters, and many other items. We've also got a lot of featured articles with photographers, including the Sony Artisans and the Sony Imaging Collective. And I, I really love those because they give you a good behind the scenes look into the workflow of many different kinds of photographers. For me, that's one of the best ways to learn just to see how other folks are doing what they do. 
Another benefit of Alpha Universe is the event calendar. While we do a lot of events with our dealers like Kenmore Camera, we also do some other Sony events not tied to a store, and this is where you can keep track of those. <clears throat> Alpha Universe can also be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Sony Alpha. Their Instagram is one of my personal sources of uh, inspiration for photography, so I highly recommend following that if you aren't already. I think they also just added a TikTok as well, so if you're using that platform, feel free to follow on there. E-support page is the next thing we're going to talk about. That's going to be your source for technical information. So you can find uh, digital copies of your manual here. I like to keep a folder of these on my phone just in case I need to look something up when I'm out and about and don't have reception. You can also download your firmware updates here. There's a specific question and answer section for each item that helps uh, cover some of the most frequently asked questions for each specific product. Uh, you can also find the help guides here. Each camera has its own help guide and it's basically a more in-depth version of the manual that you can easily search. There's an example of what the help guide looks like uh, in that image that's on the slide there. The next link is Sony Pro support. If you're a working pro and you've got at least two Sony full frame camera bodies and three Sony lenses, I'd suggest signing up for Sony Pro support. You're gonna get access to a bunch of great benefits like 24 seven phone and email support, expedited repairs, gear loans, and much more. Product registration takes a couple of minutes to do and it gets you a few added benefits. If you ever need to access your warranty, having your product registered makes the process a lot easier. Also from time to time, Sony will send out exclusive offers to those that have registered from special deals to contests or exclusive events. The Imaging Edge mobile app is a free app. It's gonna let you turn your smartphone or tablet into a live view remote. So that means that <clears throat> you'll be able to see what you're photographing with your camera via your device and you can trigger the shutter from there. That's great if you're out and you forgot your remote which happens to me all the time. I keep meaning to throw a remote in every single bag, but I don't really need to because I can use this. Imaging Edge Mobile also lets you send photos that you've already taken from your camera over to your phone so you can just post it quickly on social media. <clears throat> For me, this is really helpful when I'm traveling. I take tons and tons of photos when I'm out on a, 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 on a trip and it, it takes me a couple of months to get through them at best. What I do now, though, is that I use Imaging Edge Mobile to send photos to my phone as I'm going, and I share some to social media while I'm on, <clears throat> on my flight, taking a train, or just taking a break in a park somewhere. This helps take some of the pressure off of my editing workflow when I return from my trip because I've already got some of the stuff out there. Last but not least, the Imaging Edge desktop app. I find a lot of photographers are not really liking the new subscription model that some uh, editing software out there has shifted to. And I frequently get asked for suggestions for a one-time pay editing app like back in the old days. Well, I've got something better than that, and it's a free editing suite from Sony called Imaging Edge. Imaging Edge has three components, a remote, a viewer, and edit. The remote section lets you connect your camera to your computer and shoot tethered. The viewer lets you browse your raw raw images, and you can also apply batch edits, so that's similar to uh, Adobe Bridge or Lightroom, and the edit section lets you edit your images, so that's going to be similar to what you do in Photoshop. Imaging Edge is available for both Mac and PC, and again, it's free. Uh, if you used Imaging Edge when it first came out and haven't used it since, I'd suggest giving it another look. Uh, when it was first released, it had a lot of potential, but wasn't really quite there. Had a lot of kinks, but they've worked most of those out. It works a lot faster and it works a lot better. And I, I, I do use it, especially when I'm on the go. So let's talk a little bit about menu versions. If you've got a Sony Alpha E-mount or RX series camera, you're gonna be using one of three different menu systems. Cameras released before the A6500 have menu version one. You can see a list of those cameras there at the bottom. You can also tell because the tabs in the menu are not in color, they're black and white. Cameras released from the A6500 on have menu version two. There's a list of those cameras at the bottom there. And you can easily tell that you have that menu because the tabs at the top are gonna be in color. 
Today's class is mostly going to be focusing on uh, version two, but if you've got a camera with V1 menu, there's no need to worry. Almost all of the functions have the same name in the newer menu and are generally located in the same area with one exception that I'll talk about in a moment. So what are the advantages of that second menu over the, the first version? For one, the whole menu is much better organized. With that V2 menu, you now have headings for each menu page theme. So that just makes it easy to find related settings. And the menu has been arranged so some similar functions are much closer together. Uh, the best example of that is the movie mode settings, which in V1 were thrown all over the menu. Uh, I think there were like 11 or 12 different pages uh, that had movie settings on them. So it was a little tricky if you were just using uh, the camera for video use. Now they're just in one section that's a four page section uh, in the V2. You've got color tabs, which makes it a little, little easier to navigate. And we added a My Menu, it's that little star tab at the end. So you can create your own menu, basically. Uh, I did also mention that there's three different versions. So we've got a V3. This is going to be available on the Alpha 1, the A7S3, and the FX3. It's a completely redesigned new, not redesigned, newly designed menu that's created with touch operation in mind. And while many of the functions retain the same names, the organization and layout has been changed completely to better suit a touch interface. If you've got one of those cameras, don't worry. While I'm not covering V3 specifically, for the most part, you can still learn many things because most, almost all of these functions are going to exist in that menu as well. Uh, going forward, I think we're going to see this menu on newer cameras as they get released, but since it relies on the new operating system of the camera along with new touchscreen hardware, older cameras will unfortunately not be upgraded to this menu system. That's uh, one of the main questions I get asked, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. Sending battery life. If you have one of the newer cameras that have the larger Z100 battery, you've already got two and a half times better battery power compared to the old one. So you're already on your way to having a healthy battery, healthier battery life. But you may still feel the need to squeeze as much juice as you can out of your batteries. And there's a few things you can do to extend your battery life, regardless of which battery your camera uses. The first thing we can do is turn on airplane mode. Why does my camera have airplane mode, you might be asking? Well, the cameras have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC radios that are used for engaging with Imaging Edge Mobile, the smartphone app that we talked about earlier. If you don't plan on using that often, or you don't mind turning airplane mode on or off whenever you do use it, turning on airplane mode can help save you some battery. Next up is pre-AF. Pre-AF was a very cool function when it was first released. Basically, the camera was always looking for function. Uh, for focus so you didn't have to and if you had that decisive moment the thinking was that it was already much closer to being in focus and you wouldn't have to waste time potentially missing that moment the problem is is that the sony's focusing system has improved so much that this is just not necessary anymore it's still in the cameras but i just set it off and that's going to save you some battery power Another thing you can do to extend your battery life is to change the quality of your monitor display from high to standard. And one thing I'll note is that none of these are gonna give you like an extra week's worth of shooting or anything like that, but every little bit counts. One of the improvements we've made with the operating system over time is that just even within having the same battery, the battery life has been ex extended within that. The last thing I'd suggest to do to, uh, to do to extend your battery life is to have your power safe start time set to a low number. Power safe start time lets you set time intervals to automatically switch your camera to a power saving mode. So it's kind of like putting your computer to sleep. And this is handy if you're out and you wanna have your camera ready for a shot as you can quickly leave the power save mode by pressing the shutter button, but you don't wanna to have to constantly be tending to make sure the camera's turned on or off. Here you see the various options available to you in PowerSafe start time. I find that one minute works well for me, but feel free to experiment until you find the right time for you. Another thing you can do to help your battery situation is to use a power bank. That same power bank you might have to keep your phone powered throughout the day can actually be used to charge your battery on the go by connecting it to your camera with a USB cable. If you have a newer camera, the ones lifted on the left side here, you can actually leave the camera on and keep using it while you charge. 
I had a situation a couple of years ago when I was visiting New York and I was at the American Museum of Natural History, one of my all time favorite places to visit. I was taking photos of the dinosaur bones and I realized that my battery was down to like about 8%. I figured this was a good time to take a break and change batteries. But when I looked in my bag, I realized that I had left my little pouch with my spare batteries back at my buddy's house in Jersey City, which at that point would have been close to a three plus hour round trip on transit. Thankfully, I remembered this trick and pulled out my power bank that I had there for my phone. I plugged it into my camera with a long cable and I was able to keep shooting with while my battery got charged. So this is really handy. Uh, just a reminder, if you've got any questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A section. So let's talk a little bit about customization and getting the most out of your camera. One of my favorite features of the Sony cameras is the function menu. If you look on the back of your camera, you're gonna see an FN button. That's the function button. And when you press it, it's gonna bring up the function menu, which is a quick sub menu that's got 12 of your most important functions right there. This is a great quick way to access your most common settings without having to dig through the menu. And also has the benefit of showing you where your settings are without needing to have them like clutter up your screen with one of the display settings. The function menu is gonna come preset with the 12 functions that Sony thinks most photographers will benefit from on that camera. But if you find yourself wishing it had different options on there, you can easily customize it to your liking. Depending on the camera, you can have up to 113 different assignable menu settings. I think this actually is a little higher on the alpha one. I have to get the number for that. These go from standard things like drive mode to focus to more specific settings like image size and peaking level. The way you access the function menu customization is by navigating to camera tab two. It's going to be the purple tab. And then you find function menu set towards the last few pages. Now, once you're in function menu set, a few of the newer cameras have a visual representation of the customization screen, as you can see in the middle here, while the older ones just have a text list, as you can see on the right. Functionality remains the same between the two, and you can fully customize both the top and the bottom row on either screen. Let's talk a little bit about customizing your buttons. So I'm sure you've noticed the custom buttons on the back of your camera, C1, C2, C3, C4. Those are all customizable. They are the custom buttons, custom one, custom two. What you might not have known though, is that the majority of the buttons on the back of the camera are customizable, even if they have a function written down on them. So that AF on button, customizable. Right press on the dial that is labeled ISO, customizable. You can even customize the focused hold button if you happen to have a lens that has one. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can access the custom key settings by navigating to the purple camera two tab and then finding the custom operation section. On the older cameras, you'll see one setting for custom key. On the newer ones, you actually have three different settings, um, as you can see on the image here on the left, one for still photography, one for movie mode, and one for playback. Now, again, just like with the function menu, you'll have a slightly different design for this part of the menu depending on your camera. Newer cameras have a visual interface that will show the camera itself and the buttons you can customize. Older cameras are going to have a list of the buttons. Just like the function menu customization, the functionality is exactly the same, so you're not missing out on anything. I find that preferred custom keys, same with the uh, function menu, they're very personal. Each photographer has different needs, so they end up assigning functions to different keys based off that. For me, I like having my monitor brightness settings on C1, silent shutter on C2, rating on C3, and then I usually leave C4 as touchscreen on off. But just experiment with the things that you access the most. Write them down, make a list, and kind of just order them, and then you can distribute those to the custom keys that you like. I'd like to talk a little bit about culling in camera. For me, the culling process is one of the most arduous parts of my editing workflow. And the main reason why it's so hard for me to just jump into editing my photos without working up to it. <laughs> to improve that situation, I've started culling in camera before I upload the photos to my computer. One of the things that helps my culling is display as group. As you can see, 
on this playback screen, some of the images have a white icon on the bottom right that looks like a stack of photos. These images are in a group. Display as group is useful for when you're doing any sort of continuous shooting. So when you're taking burst shots of images of a subject. So let's take these last three uh, image groups we see here, and let's pretend each of those is 100 shots. There's 100 shots of an eagle looking like it's about to drop in the water, then 100 shots of the eagle flying against the sky, and then 100 shots of the eagle soaring over the water. Let's say I decided that the second burst of images, the one of the eagle flying in the sky, it's not really fitting the profile of my project. Previously, in order to delete those in camera, I'd have to navigate through the 100 images of the other burst, then manually select each of those and delete them like that. That's pretty tedious. With display as group, though, deleting that 100 burst group of the eagle flying, it's as simple as pressing left once to select the group and then just pressing delete. Now, it's important to note that this isn't doing anything to the file or folder structure that's on your card. All of that stays the same. The group is only visible when you are playing back in camera. Another thing to note is that you do not need to have this enabled beforehand in order for it to work. You can do it after you take the burst images. To turn this on, you wanna to navigate to the blue playback menu and turn on display as group. This on those three cameras that are mentioned there, the A6500, RX10 Mark IV, RX100 Mark VI, had a slightly different name. It was Display Continuous Shooting Group, kind of abbre abbre abbreviated, excuse me, uh, but same functionality, basically. Susan asked a question related to the custom keys. Please explain how a custom button would work with the button on the lens. I'm not sure I understand. So it's basically the same thing. Anything that you can set uh, as a custom, let me see if I can get back to here. Um, the button on that lens is going to act the same as any of the other buttons that are on the back of the camera. So let's say I want to have a button where I can turn silent shooting on or off. I can set that to that custom button to be on the lens or anywhere on the back. Let's say I have, I want to set a button to quickly bring up my focus area. I can set that to that lens button. Uh, what the lens button is set by default to is uh, focus hold. So that's useful if you are not doing back button focus and you are um, in a continuous focusing mode, obviously at that point, anytime you press or hold down that uh, shutter button, it's just gonna keep focusing. But let's say you have to, to hold, basically lock the focus on something. You don't wanna have to switch to autofocus single. You press and hold that when you're focusing and it'll lock the focus. That's what it's set by default, but you can change it to basically any button that's on there, any function that's on there. Star rating is the other facet of calling in camera. The best way to access star rating is to assign it to a custom button. Uh, just head to the purple camera two tab and then to custom uh, operation. And then you wanna click on the playback custom key setting. That's the one that's got that little play button in front of custom key. Once you're here, you wanna find the button that you want to assign uh, rating to. I prefer CF3 the C3 rather, it, that button is set to protect by default, but I personally never use that. And I like having the ability to star rate with my left hand while my right hand is navigating through the images with the dial. When you assign that button, you're gonna have a new dialog pop up that lets you select which stars you want to be able to access. For my calling process, I only use three stars. So this way I don't have to cycle through all of the stars that I don't use. One star for me goes to images that I wanna keep but are not really edit worthy. These are snapshot and just not artsy shots. Two stars for me are for images that I want to keep and I think show some promise so I can spend some time working on them in post. Three stars are for images that I'm gonna delete. That's just my process. You can use just one star of the five, you can use all five, but it's nice that it gives you the option that way you don't have to cycle through ones that you aren't using. And then here's what the star ratings look like in camera. They're gonna show up at the top middle of your images. 
Note that these ratings are written to your images metadata. So they will show up in your editing software and anywhere that has access to metadata. So if you're on a Windows system, if you go to Windows Explorer and go into the file info for that, if you go on a Mac in Finder, I believe, and go into the file info for that, anywhere that can show you your metadata, that will come up. So Lightroom, Photoshop, anything like that. Continuous shooting length. So this doesn't really help with the culling process, but it does help when you're taking burst shots. If you look at the image on the right there, you can see a white bar on the left side of the screen. When you press the shutter button down in a continuous shooting mode, as the camera's buffer begins to fill up, the white part of the bar is gonna to start to go down. The more images you take, the lower this bar will go until it finally starts reaching the bottom of the bar. You'll start seeing the word slow appear. And at that point, you are no longer shooting at the maximum amount of frames per second that your camera can handle. If you keep going beyond this, you're gonna end up filling the buffer and un be unable to take more photos until it clears up. This spot is different for every camera. Uh, just bear that in mind. And to turn this on, you wanna navigate to purple camera two tab and then to display auto review menu. Click on continuous shooting length and you'll see a few options. You'll have always display, shoot only display and not display. Now, while I like this feature a lot, I prefer to have as little visual intrusions into my frame as possible. So I set this to shoot only display. With this setting, it's only gonna come up when I'm in uh, continuous shooting and I have pressed down the shutter button and I'm actually taking images. So it's still useful. I can still access it easily, but I don't have to have it cluttering up my view when I'm uh, composing an image. All right, let me check the time real quick. Okay. Firmware updates. So firmware updates are really important. You need to think of your cameras as mini computers. Sony is constantly updating firmware on cameras in order to give you a better experience. So sometimes that's to address compatibility issues that might come up with new cameras or lenses. But we also add a lot of functionalities to the cameras via firmware updates. One great example was the version 5 update that came to the A9. This added 50 new functions to the camera. That's 5-0. All of that was for free and it basically turned it into a new camera with all of the new features. We also released a few big updates to some other cameras around that time, adding things like the newly updated focusing system for eye autofocus and animal eye autofocus and interval shooting. The first thing you wanna do is check and make sure that your camera is up to date with firmware. You do that by navigating to the last page of the toolbox setup menu and click on version. Here you're gonna be able to see what firmware version your camera currently has. The A7R3 in the example here is out of date. So I'd want to update that. You, you'll notice that there's also a version number for the lens you have attached. So we actually have firmware updates for some of our lenses. We've made many major updates to our focusing systems in the cameras. And from time to time, we're gonna update the lens firmware in order to best work with that newer focusing system. The firmware update process is pretty simple. First up, you need to download the firmware file. You can go to sony.com and find the product page for your camera and just go into the download section. I usually just go on Google. So uh, with the A7R2, that's an example here, I'd search for Sony A7R2 firmware update. And the first sony.com result, that's gonna be the firmware. It saves me a little bit of time in clicking. Uh, when you get to the download page, you're going to see the window on the left there. That's going to give you a nice summary of what the firmware update is doing. When you start the file, you'll see the dialog on the right there, which gives you a step-by-step -step uh, dummy proof instructions. I know some people get scared of doing the firmware updates, but it's actually pretty easy and safe. Uh, in order to update the firmware on a lens, it's gonna, you're gonna go through the same process. You just gotta make sure that that lens is attached to the camera when you connect the camera to the computer. Image stabilization. Talk a lot about the five axis stabilization with the Sony full frame cameras and on some of the APS-C cameras, but what does that really mean? Basically, when you're hand holding your camera, all of the bumps and shaking are gonna move your camera along the five axes of motion. Those are X and Y, pitch and yaw, and roll. What the five axis stabilization does is it can sense all of these small motions and it will correct for them. 
It's basically moving the sensor around so that it compensates for all of these movements. This is going to give you anywhere from a four to six stop advantage, depending on the camera. What this means is that, that you are now able to use slower shutter speeds and still get a sharp image that's not blurry without having to bump up your ISO. So if the slowest shutter speed you can comfortably handhold your camera and lens is 1 60th of a second, for example, you can now likely do 1 10th of a second, 1 5th of a second with that in-body stabilization. Of course, every situation in photographer is different, but regardless of how steady or not steady your hands are, this is going to help quite a bit. This is especially handy when doing any sort of handheld macro work or using a long tel longer telephoto lens, as those situations tend to exaggerate any camera shake. Uh, one very important note, make sure to turn off the stabilization when you are using your camera on a tripod. The system is so good at what it does that it will actually send sense micro vibrations like the wind hitting the camera or you moving around your tripod and it's going to try to correct for them. Uh, this is going to potentially create soft images that aren't as sharp as they should be. It's not going to be super, super blurry, but it's, it's not giving you the sharp crispness that you deserve. Uh, this is a good example that I photographed on my balcony. It was well into twilight, so it was much darker than it seems in these photos, but I slowed down the shutter speed to let more light in. On the left is the image with the stabilization on. It looks perfectly in focus and sharp. On the close-up uh, close zoom at the bottom, you can see the sharp details like the edge of each petal and the dark pink lines in the flower. Now on the right is the same image taken without stabilization. I'm pretty good at hand holding, but this shutter speed was just too slow for me and everything is slightly blurred. If you look at the close-up on the bottom, you can see that it's missing a lot of that sharp detail from the example on the left. You can make out that it's a flower and has edges, but none of those edges are sharp. The detail in all of those little pink lines, those are all gone. Now in the menu, the stabilization is called Optical Steady Shot, OSS. On some lenses, you will see physical buttons for OSS. If you click this over to off, it's gonna turn off all of the stabilization. It's, it's all or nothing. <clears throat> mode one, and you'll see on some of the longer lenses, you'll have one or two modes, and on some of the newer ones, you'll have up to three modes. Mode one is going to be for just standard handheld photography. Mode two is optimized for panning shots, so things like a car driving down the street or running, running vertically, uh, horizontally, sorry, across the track. A few lenses like the 400G Master here and the newer 200-600G They've got an additional mode, mode three. This mode is optimized for tracking. So if you're tracking a subject across a scene, one that is not just moving left or right, mode three is the mode for you. Silent shooting. This is one of my favorite features of the Sony Alpha cameras. And while it's great, there are some situations where it does not work well. Let's get into how it works first. The way the shutter works for alt cameras is that a mechanical shutter opens, light comes in and hits the sensor, and then the shutter closes. This is basically what the shutter speed is. In silent shooting mode, we are using the electronic shutter. Instead of a physical shutter opening and closing, the sensor itself is doing a scan of the entire frame from top to bottom. The pros here is that we can use the camera completely silently. Many situations where you couldn't really use a loud clicking camera are now available to you. Things like weddings, sports, like golf, a sleeping child, um, photographing in a theater, classical concerts, etc. Well, that's great. Why don't you just use silent shutter all the time? Well, there's two main reasons. The first is shooting in fluorescent or mixed lighting. The other is with fast moving subjects. We'll cover those two in a moment. But first, how to turn on silent shooting. Navigate to the camera two menu and turn on silent shooting to on. I usually have this assigned to my C2 custom button for easy access. On the A9, A92, and Alpha 1, it's a little different. They actually refer to it as electronic sensor, mechanical sensor, and you have a few more options for how to use it in there. So the first issue with silent shutter mode on any camera other than the A9 or Alpha 1 is something called banding. This is when the light is oscillating at a faster frequency than the sensor is being read. 
the best example of this is by starting at the bottom right part of the image, you can see that there's a bar with a blue tint, then a bar above that, a bar of true color, then another blue bar, then true color, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, the light source flashed through the scene multiple times while the sensor was being read. Here's an example of that same scene with a mechanical shutter. Now, this was taken uh, in Times Square. If you've been to Times Square in the last probably decade at this point, they have this just insane army of LED screens. And LED screens are a bit of a nightmare for photography. Uh, it gets to the point where they can even trip up mechanical shutters. So uh, that's definitely a place you don't want to do any sort of silent shutter. And you can kind of see the example and the reasons why here. The other issue with silent shutter is something called rolling shutter. This is when the action in the scene is moving faster than the electronic shutter can read itself. Golf is a quiet sport and might think that the silent shutter is great for that, but if you try to use it, you're going to end up with a curved club like you see on the left there. This happens because the club was moving so fast, it went through the frame quicker than the electronic sensor was being read. A9 Alpha 1, however, they have an anti-distortion shutter and can do shutter speeds up to 132 thousandths of a second, which is just insanely fast. It happens to be fast enough to avoid rolling shutter in most situations. So one of the big advantages of a camera like the Alpha 9 or the Alpha 1 lets you use that silent shutter in situations where banding or rolling shutter would interfere with capturing your image. Golf tournaments are a great example. Traditionally, you were not allowed to make a shutter click noise until after the club had made contact with the ball. Since the A9 came out a few years ago, though, you see more and more photos of the swing itself from tournaments because the camera is completely silent. Imaging Edge Webcam. So Sony now has a utility called Imaging Edge Webcam. It's a free software. You can uh, go to that link right there at the bottom and it'll be on the next page, or just go to sony.com and search for imaging a webcam. Basically, it lets you use almost all of the Sony cameras as a webcam. So if you saw my feed earlier, that's basically what you can accomplish. Um, they actually ended up adding so many more cameras on here than I was expecting. Uh, the only notable exception is the A6000 and I guess if you have a 5,000, that's just been a long time. But even the 5100s on here, and with any of these cameras, you're able to use uh, that camera as a webcam. The ZV-1 and the ZV-10 actually have a slightly different version of this that's built into the camera. It actually works a little better, uh, but on all of these other cameras, you're able to use that util utility to use your Sony camera as a webcam do a time check. All right, so time lapse. On the current generation camera, Sony's added a free interval shoot function that lets you capture images that you can turn into a time lapse movie. If you're unfamiliar with time lapses, they're basically movies that appear to make time speed up. They're created by taking images at fixed intervals and combining those into a movie with video editing software and post. They basically let you compress time. Hours turn into minutes, minutes turn to seconds. I particularly like them because they're great for showcasing the interesting ways that things move when you speed them up beyond their normal speed. Click play on this again. The air balloons here are a great example with how they almost seem to be bouncing up and down, but in real time we wouldn't notice because this whole scene probably went over 40 minutes, an hour, something like that. So to access interval, the interval shooting function, you want to navigate to the shoot mode slash drive section of the first camera tab. Once you're in here, you're going to see a couple of pages of settings. First off, we want to turn interval shooting on. Next setting is going to be shooting start time. This is basically just a timer. You've got up to 99 minutes between the time you click the shutter button and the interval shooting is actually going to start up. This is particularly handy when you have to set your tripod and camera up in a remote location that you're not necessarily going to have easy access to. So you can basically just set it up and forget it. Shooting interval uh, that lets you set how much time passes between each photo that's captured. This is the basic essence of time lapse that the interval, how long in between the shots. 
number of shots is pretty self-explanatory. It's the total number of images your camera is going to capture after you start the interval shooting process. As you adjust these two settings, you're going to notice that the shooting time estimate at the bottom of the screen is going to change with every change you make in there. This is going to help give you an idea of how much time your time lapse capture is going to take. <coughs> If you have a fixed time length event, so let's say you want to capture a sunset with an hour before and an hour's after worth of images, you can also use this to make sure that your interval and number of shot settings add up to the correct amount of time. The last setting here we'll talk about is the auto exposure tracking sensitivity. This is very helpful for situations like sunrises and sunsets where the exposure of the scene is going to change throughout the shooting time. Mid is a good place to start. If you want the exposure to react quickly, you can set it to high, or if you want it set, if you want to set it to low, that's going to help you out with smoother expo exposure changes. I'm going to advise that you be very careful with that high setting, though. Due to the sped up nature of time lapses, frequent exposure changes, they can end up looking like flickering. So most of the time, you're likely going to have this on mid or low. If you've ever seen an interval where it just seems like there's just flashing that keeps happening, part of that is because they had their exposure sensitivity set way too high. Uh, now for the actual interval timing, I wanna share a few suggestions to get you started. Feel free to take a screenshot of this or take a photo of it with your phone or camera. Uh, I suggest one second intervals for things like moving traffic or fast clouds. Three second intervals are useful for things like sunsets, sunrises, or normal speed clouds. Uh, five second intervals are good for crowded or busy places like a park or an intersection downtown. 20 second intervals are good for the sun moving across the sky or to capture a shadow that's moving across the ground. And 30 second intervals are good for stars or other night sky subjects like the Milky Way. These aren't perfect, just like with the exposure of a photograph, there's gonna be many factors that can contribute to what interval you're gonna end up using, but I think these serve as a good starting point. I'll leave this up for another couple of seconds in case anyone wanted to get an image of this. Now, for the software to make your time-lapse movies, you usually start by editing the images in Lightroom and exporting the resized images. For the movie itself, if you have video editing software like Adobe Premiere or Final Cut, you can use those to turn the images into a time-lapse movie. Another alternative is a program called LR Time-lapse, which you can download at lrtimelapse.com. I haven't had a chance to use this, but I've heard a lot of great things about it. Uh, a lot of the time-lapse pros or wizards out there that this is what they've been using for a long time. SMQ. SMQ stands for slow and quick. It's a special video mode available on the newer Sony cameras. And this mode lets you create slow motion and quick motion videos right in the camera without having to use a video editing program. Bear with me, my PowerPoint keeps freezing. There we go. So here's a good example of a slow motion video that was captured with SMQ. We had a model shoot set up with falling snow uh, and with SMQ, we were able to capture a slow motion video that we could instantly share. This video is straight out of camera. We didn't do any editing to it. We just used the SMQ mode. <coughs> to use SMQ, you're going to have to move your mode dial to the SMQ mode. And if you'd like to access the settings for SMQ mode, navigate to the movie section of the camera, and it should be right on the first page of that second tab. S and Q exposure mode, that's going to let you select what exposure mode you'd like. You can do program auto, exposure priority, shutter speed priority, or full manual. If you go into S and Q settings, you'll be able to set the record rate and the frame rate. We'll start with frame rate. The more frames per second you have, the slower the video can look. The less frames per second you have, the faster your video will look. Now, record setting is like a playback speed on top of that, but it works in the opposite manner. The bigger that number, the faster the movie. The smaller that number, the slower it is. 
I, I know that's a bit confusing. So let's take a look at some examples here. To get slow motion, you want to bump up the frame rate to a high number of frames per second. Here we're doing 120 frames per second with a record setting of 30p. That gives us a four times slow motion video. If I lower the record setting to 24p, we'd end up with a five times slow motion video. Now with quick motion, you want a smaller number of frames per second. So if I went with one frame per second at 60p for the re record setting, we'd end up with a 60 time quick motion video. If you're thinking to yourself that this sounds similar to what a time-lapse movie would do, you're right. The quick motion part of s &Q is basically creating a time-lapse movie for you. The difference here is that you get a full movie created in camera, but with a lot less settings that you can adjust compared to using interval shooting. So if I just wanted a quick time-lapse that I could share without having to edit and post, I'd use s &Q for the time-lapse. If I wanted to be able to correct exposure or color grade my time-lapse, I would go with interval shooting. Here's a handy chart that shows you all of the different setting variations and exactly what type of slow or quick motion you're gonna get with the settings. I'll leave this up on the screen for a couple of seconds in case someone wants to take a screenshot or an image with your phone or camera. And as a reminder, if anyone's got any questions, please feel free to throw those in the Q&A. See, we're running a little short on time, so I'm gonna cut through these next parts rather quickly. Just bear with me one moment. This is there and then, okay. All right, expanding your dynamic range. Dynamic range refers to the distance between your lightest light to the darkest dark in an image. If you have more dynamic range, you're able to capture more parts of the scene. You may have noticed that it's hard to capture a scene inside your living room during daylight hours if there's windows present. You either get a nice exposure for your living room, but the image outside the windows is all white and washed out, or you expose properly for the outside portion, but the inside ends up looking dark. That's because the scene has more dynamic range than your camera can capture. If you shoot raw files, you have a lot of dynamic range at your disposal. The downside is you usually need to do some editing in order to bring this out. If you shoot JPEGs exclusively, it's typically because you don't want to have to do any editing and post. So there's two things you can use in your camera that are gonna let you expand your dynamic range without having to edit them. One is DRO, the other is HDR. DRO stands for Dynamic Range Optimizer. And when this is enabled, the camera is basically analyzing the scene for you when you take the photo, and it's gonna automatically adjust the exposure in camera after you've taken an image. It does a fairly decent job with boosting your shadows up so they have more light. Uh, it doesn't work as well with washed out highlights, so I suggest making sure you have those exposed properly when you take an image. DRO gives you the option of manually setting the DRO level, which is how much of this effect is applied from one to five or you can set it to auto. I usually have it set on auto because that does a pretty good job most of the times. And then I'll just change it to level five if I need a little more. Again, DRO works completely in camera. Camera is doing the adjustments for you. Bear in mind that this is not gonna look as good as if you were to take a raw file and edit it in post, and you may end up with some noise. But if the goal here is to just shoot JPEGs and not worry about editing, then this shouldn't really be an issue. Big advantage of using DRO instead of HDR, which we'll talk about in a moment, is that you can do this without a tripod. <coughs> Excuse me. HDR, on the other hand, needs to be used with the tripod. HDR stands for high dynamic range. In HDR mode, the camera will take three images for you and it's gonna blend them together in camera. So when you start the sequence, it takes one image at the normal exposure that you have set up a bright shot in order to capture some shadow detail, and then a darker shot in order to capture highlight detail. It then combines the three images into one and you end up with both the blended shot and the normal exposure shot on your card. If you compare the larger blended shots of the space and you'll hear to the normal shot on the right, you can see there's a lot more detail in both the shadows and the highlights. Again, with HDR, you need to make sure your camera is on a tripod or a sturdy surface when the camera, where the camera isn't gonna move or else you're gonna end up with weird ghosting artifacts in your image. 
this also does not really work well with moving subjects. So even if you're on a tripod, if there are people walking through your scene or a car moving through your scene, that's gonna get blended and it's potentially not gonna look good. Here's a good example of HDR. So if you've ever tried to take a landscape photo of the mountains when the sun is setting, you've likely noticed how hard it is to get a good exposure because you will have parts of the hill that are in deep shadows and other parts that are brightly lit up by the sunlight. With HDR though, you're able to capture more detail in both the shadow and the highlights. So this is the final HDR captured image. You can see that there is a good amount of information in the shadows at the bottom and the highlights of the Alpen glow that's happening in the back, those are captured nicely. Now I'll give the caveat that you need to decide what's going to look good. I don't, I don't think either of these shots particularly looks good, but if your goal is to capture the scene kind of as you're doing it, I think this will work. If you are serious about, uh, Trying to capture a scene like this, which I'll, I'll just tell you right now, trying to capture this kind of scene with very dark shadows and then um, the bright highlights in the back, you'll you'll probably notice that you haven't seen many nice photos of this. It's just because it's a nightmare. But I would suggest maybe getting into doing actual HDR manually, uh, where you basically set up bracketing and you take a bunch of different images and then you can combine them in Photoshop or in uh, third-party software. Um, but at this point. The goal is if you're just doing JPEGs, you don't want to edit stuff, HDR will help out with just expanding the dynamic range of this a little bit. Let me check the time. All right, we are running close to being out of time. So I'm going to skip to the end. Again, if anyone has any questions, I see there's a couple in there now, please uh, ask them in the Q&A section now. And before we get to answering questions, I just want to mention again that we've managed to secure a special discount for all of the Sony photographers in this class that attended this class today. Uh, you'll get more details on this uh, in an email that will be sent, but basically you get up to 10% on select camera bodies, up to 15% off select lenses and accessories. Uh, I will just warn you right now, it's not going to include anything that came out this year, basically, because most of that stuff still isn't in stock. So no Alpha 1 and no ZV-E10, unfortunately. Um, ballot starting today all the way through next Monday, the 27th. You have to be a registered attendee of this class. Uh, nationwide shipping. So um, if you are not located in Washington or near Seattle and don't want to drive out to Kenmore Camera, you can give them a call. More details on that in the email. And it is limited to in-stock items, no special orders or rain checks. If you were holding back on getting something, if there was just something that was piquing your interest but you weren't really sold on it, I will say this is a fantastic discount. We don't generally do um, kind of blanket discounts like this. This is on top of whatever all already instant rebates we've got going on. So just give it a look feel free to give them a call and, and see what they can work out for you with this. So, man, my PowerPoint is not liking me today. All right, questions and answers. I don't see a lot, which means I did a good job or everyone's being very shy, but let's see what we need on here. Uh, Jesse asked, does HDR average out sensor or ISO noise as well? The in-camera doesn't really, from what I've noticed, so if you're shooting at a high ISO, it's not going to make that any better. Uh, same with like, you know, most um, external HDR programs, they'll, they'll have like a noise component, but if you just combine a noisy image, it, most of the time it just makes it worse. So uh, that's also the benefit of having it on a tripod. You can do that HDR mode with slower shutter speeds so you can have uh, a lower ISO. Okay. Lisa asks, what is the fastest shutter speed when your camera is on full auto? That is a good question. And I think that really depends on the camera. Uh, let me bump out the only camera that I've actually got in front of me. Do I have a battery on this? So I haven't been in full auto in a while. 
I'll, I'll get back to you if I can get a chance. That does change depending on the camera. One thing I'll mention about ISO is that if you are using auto ISO in any of the other modes, you can set a minimum and a maximum, which is really handy. Uh, what's good about that is you can, let's say shoot in, in full manual, set your shutter speed, set your aperture, but you can still have the variable of ISO and set that maximum to be, let's say 6,400 or 12,000, something that you're comfortable with. So you have some variability uh, in terms of the exposure, but you don't have to worry about the camera just automatically going to an ISO range. That's gonna be too noisy uh, for what you're looking to accomplish. Sandy asked, when doing a time lapse, what mode should you be shooting in? Example for sunrise or sunset, aperture priority, shutter, or manual. I am a big fan of, especially if you're going to have something on a tripod, just set manual for the most part. Uh, if you aren't comfortable with that and you want to work up to that, that's fine. That's why the other options still exist. Uh, you have to decide if your priority is going to be shutter speed or aperture. Um, I, I would probably stay away from um, the, the issue is if you start doing shutter speed priority, that means that aperture is going to be a var variable. So depending on how much the light changes in the scene, you may end up getting something where the visual aspect looks a little weird in between frames if it's changing the aperture. So I, I'd, I'd go full auto or manual. It, it would be my suggestions for that. Rich Lawrence asks, can you do circulation of focus point on the A7R 4A? I don't have an A. I would assume so. I don't know why they would have removed that because I believe that still has the same exact menu. Um, I don't remember exactly where that is on that menu, but as far as I know, that should still be on there. Uh, circulation, circulation of focus point for those that don't know basically allows you to, you know, if you've got a focus point that you're moving left or right, Traditionally, when you move it all the way to the left most part of the screen, that's it. You can keep pressing left, but it doesn't do anything. With circulation of focus point enabled, you can press left once it's on the edge and it'll flip all the way to the right side. So it kind of just acts like it's like a portal going from one end to the other. Uh, useful for some sports shooters or people that just need a quick way to kind of move stuff around. Uh, Jim H asked, where do I set for recording images to both cards? That depends on the camera. Uh, generally speaking, the setting is called rec media settings. And in the, once you're in there, you have the ability to set uh, if you want to write to both cards, if you want to write JPEG to one, RAW to the other, if you want to uh, write images to one, video to another, or if you want to set it as overflow. So as soon as the first card is full, it'll overflow onto the second one. Uh, but it's called Rec Media Settings. Susan asked, how do you sync the camera to the phone? That is unfortunately a longer answer, and I don't really have a good visual for that. Uh, if you go on YouTube and just search, uh, insert your camera, let's say you have an A7C, put uh, Imaging Edge A7C Sync. Um, if you have the app, and one of the newer cameras, it's pretty simple because most of what you need to do is just scan that QR code. Uh, it can be a little trickier on iPhone sometimes, but it's not hard once you've connected it once. Uh, I saw a question earlier. Uh, let me go back to that. Uh, Eileen asked if, uh, if you get notified about your products being uh, updated in terms of firmware updates. So if you're using Imaging Edge Mobile, once you've connected uh, your camera to it, it knows that your camera belongs to you. So if that camera has a firmware update, you will get a notification through that app uh, that that firmware was updated, which for me is very handy because I've got samples of all these cameras. So it's a little hard to keep track of that sometimes. And it's nice that it gives me that reminder. Let me check the time. Got a minute left. Let me see if I can do any other um, questions right here. That will be good for everyone. Uh, Mara asks, are there any tips on the animal eye focus for working best? What I would say to keep in mind right now is if you have a creature that is moving around a lot, you're, bet you're mostly better off using one of the tracking photo modes more than the 
animal eye autofocus. At this point, animal eye autofocus works well, but it works well with animals that aren't like really running around the scene. So if you've got a dog or a cat or something, uh, that that's fine. But if you if you're trying to track an animal that's running across the scene or moving erratically, I would suggest doing one of the uh, tracking uh, focus areas instead. I think that'll work out a lot better for you. Let's see, I think we'll try to get to one or more questions. Uh, one person mentioned that they had heard that the newer cameras, you don't have to turn off the stabilization. I haven't particularly heard that. The, the thing is, is that you can do it and you might not notice a difference because when I first started and someone told me that I was like, no, you don't, I, I don't ever do that. And it's fine. But when I started pixel peeping, I started realizing, oh, some of these are not really quite as sharp. You're never going to see a distinct blur, at least in my experience, if you leave your stabilization on when you're on a tripod, um, but it is going to give you softer images. The one exception is if you are using a gimbal head that is loose in order to take photos of wildlife, that you kind of have to go back and forth and see what works best for you. Um, if you happen to be using a lens that has the um, mode three uh, tracking, I would probably leave the stabilization on for that just go back and forth. But for everything else, particularly landscape or anything else, just always turn it off. And I'm gonna cap it with that. And if Heather's still around, I will uh, have her come and say yes, goodbye to everyone. I am, I am. Hello and thank you, Hector. That was awesome. Um, a lot of good info in there. Um, I wanna tell everybody and I put it in the chat that um, Hector's got the recording going on his computer and it will render and I will be going home before it's done rendering. So I'll send it out tomorrow morning and I get here pretty early. So um, we'll get that up tomorrow and you will get the email with the uh, Sony discount specials. Um, I have it scheduled to go out our time at seven. So should be coming within the next half hour. And thank you, Sarah, for getting all those questions in the background. So, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks to both, and thanks to everyone else for joining. Hopefully get to do some more fun Sony stuff coming up. Yes, yes, and look for our, got our expo planning in, the, uh, in motion here. So we'll be coming out with some stuff with that for in a couple of weeks, so watch for that. Um, we'll have some great, great classes and a great Sony speaker and artisan course, so. Um, but anyway, thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of your night and a great week. Thank you, Hector. Thank you Bye. all.